Good afternoon. Actually, good morning. The first item of business. Yes. The first item of business is general questions, and at question number one, I call Miles Briggs. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it will end the reported practice of children and young people being admitted to adult services for treatment rather than an NHS specialist child and adolescent mental health ward. Cabinet Secretary Neil Gray. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. We expect children and young people who require inpatient mental health care to be looked after in age-appropriate facilities. We have three regional young person units providing specialist support to young people from across Scotland, as well as a national child psychiatric inpatient unit. Very occasionally, a young person will be admitted to an adult ward, for example, where they require an admission to an intensive psychiatric care unit and cannot be safely cared for in an open adolescent unit. Admission will be for the shortest possible time and under strict conditions, including supervision from CAMS clinicians and following the admission to adult mental health wards for under 18s guidance. Miles Briggs. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? I recently held a round table in Parliament and welcomed Jane and Dave Macdonald to tell MSPs about the experience of their son Harris. And I thank the MSPs who attended that meeting. At that meeting, they bravely read out Harris's essay, Escape, which captured his time being held in an adult service. Harris said, when I became unwell, I was admitted to Huntley Burn Adult Psychiatric Unit because there were no beds in Scotland available in any young person's unit. No other young person should have to go through the experience I had. It was the wrong place for someone who was already mixed up, frightened and unsure of who they were. The environment heightened my anxiety. After treatment for my injuries, I was cared for in the young person's unit in Edinburgh for two months, and I began then my recovery. Harris Macdonald sadly, tragically, took his own life in 2020. Now, I welcome the meeting I recently managed to secure with Marie Todd, and, and the family have also taken forward uh, meetings with her as well. And I also welcome the news of a fatal accident inquiry, which is now also going to take place in Harris's case. But the scandal of children and young people still being admitted to adult services has to end and has gone on for too long. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if the Scottish Government will now act and agree to introduce a ban on children and young people being admitted to adult services? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you. I, I thank uh, Miles Briggs, uh, not just for his work in representing the Macdonald family, to whom I pass my sincere condolences and, and, and pay tribute to the incredible work that they are doing through the Harris Trust in, um, in Harris's memory, uh, but also pay tribute to uh, Miles Briggs for the work he has done, including the, the meeting that he has had with my colleague uh, Marie Todd. Um, of course, um, circumstances like that uh, are uh, a horrendous situation for any family to be dealing with, and we will keep working uh, to ensure that they are avoided. Uh, to enhance uh, future provision, we are providing funding to boards to develop regional adolescent uh, intensive psychiatric care units. And we currently have 54 CAMs in patient beds across Scotland for children and adolescents uh, in uh, Dud Hope Young Persons Unit, Melville Young Persons and uh, Sky House. Uh, these units admit children and young people from health boards in their region with the flexibility to admit from other regions in the, of the, if the unit uh, closest to a child or young person is full. Uh, of course, I will take on board the ask that Miles Briggs uh, has raised, uh, but I return to the point that I made at, at my uh, opening, um, that in some circumstances, uh, I hope rare circumstances, it is uh, necessary to ensure um, the safe delivery of care for children and young people, uh, that sometimes they do need to be uh, seen uh, in uh, adult services, uh, but that must be by following uh, that guidance that I mentioned uh, and also uh, making sure that it is avoided uh, wherever possible. Question number two, Ariane Burgess. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will consider increasing funding for the empty homes officers in light of the First Minister's reported statement that empty homes are key to tackling the housing emergency. Minister Paul McLennan. Since 2010, we have invested over 800,000 to embed empty homes officers within councils through funding for the Scottish Homes uh, Partnership. The member rightly highlights the effectiveness of the approach as endorsed by the independent audit last year, with 9,000 homes being brought back into use. Well, it is for councils to determine how to employ the resources to best effect. The audit recognises the critical role officers play in unlocking barriers, particularly with private owners. 
They are an essential component of the partnership's co-produced strategic home, empty homes framework approach to maximise impact across local authority housing services. We recently updated guidance to councils about utilising the ring fence revenue they derive from council tax on second and empty homes to fund more officers. Burgess. I thank the Minister for that uh, response. In Tyree, a constituent was recently on the brink of leaving the island where her family work and volunteer because they could not find a home to rent. 36% of homes in Tyree do not meet local needs as they are either holiday lets or empty homes. Argyll and Butte Council and Tyree Community Development Trust are working hard with the resources they have to address this, but many people across the Highlands and Islands still can't find or afford a decent home in the community where they want to live. What more is the Scottish Government doing to get empty properties back into use as homes for people who need them? Minister. Yeah, I recently met with uh, housing associations and development trusts in, in Argyll and Butte, probably with a local member, probably about a month ago, to discuss that particular point. Again, it is up to the local authority in terms of how it, it how uses its funds and empty homes officers. But I think there is a real role for development uh, uh, trusts in this as well. And I am happy to meet the member to discuss further in terms of that, because I think their role that they can bring to that is essential. Brief supplementary, Pam Gossel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last month, the Scottish Government declared a housing emergency with tens of thousands of people struggling to find suitable accommodation. However, the latest Scottish Government figures have shown that the number of long-term empty properties have increased by 4% to more than 46,000 in the scope of a year. The Scottish Conservatives, as well as the charities such as Crisis, have called for the creation of a fund which would allow councils to convert convert such properties into affordable housing. Therefore, I ask the Minister, does the Scottish Government intend on introducing such a fund? Minister. At the moment, I think I mentioned our investment. We have invested £3.7 million in the partnerships, into homes partnership since 2010. We have brought back 9,000 9, homes since 2010. I know there was a, a previous announcement where the Scottish Tories wanted to spend £255 million to back, bring back 7,400 homes. So I think our approach demonstrates it is the best way to kind of go ahead with that. I meet with local authorities and discuss these particular points. We are always encouraging, and it is up to local authorities, to take on more empty homes uh, partnership officers in terms of that. And only this morning I met with Edinburgh to dis uh, discuss that point, who are taking on more empty homes partnerships. But again, happy to discuss the, the issue with the, the member. Question number three, Craig Hoy. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with NHS Lothian and NHS Borders regarding financial stability in the 2024-2025 financial years. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. Despite our significant investment in 24-25, over half a billion uh, increase presenting a real-term uplift to frontline boards, the system remains under extreme pressure as a result of the ongoing impacts of COVID, Brexit, inflation and the UK Government spending decisions. Uh, the Scottish Government's Financial Delivery Unit worked closely with all boards, including uh, Lothian and Borders, as part of the financial planning process. And the Scottish Government met with both NHS Lothian and NHS Borders on multiple occasions to develop uh, and implement a 24-25 financial plan uh, this year. Uh, quarter one reviews will be held in the coming months to assess their current financial performance. Craig Hoy. Mr Gray is aware that both health boards fa face a bleak financial future as a result of the SNP's misplaced financial priorities. The decisions they are now taking are causing real concerns to NHS staff and to worried patients. In the Scottish borders, 92 essential community hospital beds, including those in Kelso, Hoyke, Duns and Peebles, are at risk. And in East Lothian, the Eddington and Belhaven hospitals and the Abbey and Blossom care homes have both been summarily closed without any consultation. And to top it all, GPs in East Lothian are facing massive increases in facilities management fees. Despite it being the root cause of these problems, the Scottish Government is passing the buck, with Michael Taylor of the Primary Care Directorate re recently writing to me to say that whilst the Scottish Government had a national approach to the issue of facilities management fees, it was for boards to agree, and I quote, any fair and equitable approach. Isn't it time, therefore, for the Scottish Government to step in, properly fund boards and halt these damaging uh, charges and closures? 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you. Uh, there is, of course, uh, no hint of irony in Craig, uh, Craig Hoy's uh, question there around the financial stability of our boards, because the decisions that we have taken uh, to come forward with a more progressive form of taxation has raised a billion and a half more uh, for public services here in Scotland, opposed by the Scottish Conservatives. Indeed, uh, the allocation uh, of uh, the uh, Barnet consequentials that came from the spring budget uh, to the NHS was also opposed by the Scottish Conservatives. They wanted us uh, to divert that uh, to business tax relief, which they are well entitled to do, but they, if they had uh, their way, we would have seen an even worse situation for our boards uh, in the financial challenges that they face. With regards to uh, the situation faced by GP practices, of course uh, I uh, value greatly the work that they do, but it is a situation for uh, boards uh, to come forward with uh, and resolve. We invested over £1.2 billion in general medical services in 2023-24, fully committed to increasing the number of GPs in Scotland to ensure uh, more people get the right care in the right place at the time, right time. We've got a record number of GPs uh, in training uh, and 271 more uh, GPs per headcount uh, in Scotland as a result of our actions. We'll, of course, keep supporting the work that they do in primary care, which is the bedrock uh, of our health service. I'm going to call Sarah Boyack for a brief supplementary, but before I do so, I would just remind all members that the length of questions and responses in this session mean that it's impossible for me to get all members in who would wish to. Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. With 84% of Scotland's future population growth in the Lothians, NHS Lothian is in desperate need of investment. But our health boards are already having to make 6% savings by cutting vital services such as diabetes technology. And yesterday, campaign group Peak Keep reinforced the urgent need for investment in a new eye pavilion in our meeting with the CABSEC. So what will the Scottish Government do now to ensure our health board has the funding to cope with a substantial increase in our population now and in the future? I thank Sarah Boyack for her question. Of course, uh, as I outlined to Craig Hoy, we have passed on a real terms increase uh, to our frontline boards uh, so that they can respond to the challenges that are being faced post COVID, post Brexit, uh, responding to inflation uh, and uh, the UK cost of living crisis. In spite of that 3% real terms increase, which of course we have delivered in the face of a falling uh, block grant uh, from Westminster, I recognise that there are challenges uh, remaining. But for Lothian, we have increased. Uh, the budget by £82.2 uh, million uh, pounds this year. Uh, I recognise that challenges still persist, and the question uh, that Sarah Boyack raised uh, around the I Pavilion, of course, the position we face with regards to capital is even more acute because of the £1.3 billion pounds cut that has come to our capital budget from the UK Government. So it is incumbent uh, on uh, colleagues across the Chamber to ensure that they are lobbying the UK Government, whichever colour comes next, to properly invest in the health service rather than seeing continued austerity, which is currently on offer from both parties. Question number four, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Communication Workers Union's call for housing standards to be updated to ensure that letterboxes are positioned at a suitably accessible height. Minister Paul McLennan. The Scottish Government is aware of the Communication Workers Union long standard, uh, long standard campaign highlighting the health and safety issues that low level letterboxes present to their members. I recognise the benefits addressing this issue would have for their members and more generally for accessibility and safety of homes. Officials are engaged with the CWU and are assessing options for amendment to building standards guidance, subject to further engagement with industry stakeholders. This would help provide more explicit guidance on the positioning of letterboxes where these are provided in new dwellings. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Mr. I have been working with the CWU's National Health and Safety Officer on the issue of low-level letterboxes for over a year and a dialogue with Scottish Government officials on this also. And I'm told that there are no objections to low-level letterboxes being banned for future developments and door replacements as it would benefit postal workers by reducing their risk of injury. So can the Minister outline what steps the Scottish Government is taking to try to implement this policy? Minister. I'm committed to reviewing the building standards guidance with regards to low-level letterboxes and working with stakeholders to confirm there are no un unintended consequences prior to the potential introduction into building standards guidance. Officials will continue to engage with the CWU and with wider industry stakeholders to assess options for amendment to building standards guidance. I would reassure the member that updates to guidance will follow this process as quickly as possible. Thank you. Question number five, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what steps it is taking to increase the number of GPs. 
Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. Let me be clear. GPs are highly valued with our NHS. I thank them for their tireless work supporting patients in our communities. I remain fully committed to increasing the number of GPs in Scotland by 800 by 2027. The GP headcount has increased by 271 since 2017 and is consistently over 5,000. Training new GPs is key. We have expanded GP specialty training, adding 35 places this academic year and 35 places next year. There are are currently over 1,200 trainee GPs in Scotland, a record, and we invest over a million pounds in a range of recruitment and retention initiatives. Dennis Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. Can I advise the Chamber on how GP numbers in Scotland compare to other parts of the UK? And given concerns raised by constituents about the time taken to obtain an appointment, how can patient numbers presenting at GPs? How have patient numbers presenting at GP surgeries risen since the pandemic? And what work has been undertaken with surgeries to improve the efficiency of their appointment systems? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Kenneth Gibson is correct that uh, the situation with GP numbers in Scotland, we have a far higher number of GPs per head of population here in Scotland than is uh, present in England or indeed uh, in Wales. That is not a situation that we're complacent about, which is why we're investing uh, in the GP training programmes that we are, as well as the recruitment and retention work, uh, and ensure that there is an equity of access between urban uh, and uh, rural areas, which is why the Scott Gem uh, programme uh, is so important, as well as the rural uh, fellowship uh, programme. Of course, uh, the, uh, the, we know that 90 per cent of all health service uh, interactions come at primary care uh, and that the complexity of patients arriving at GP practices uh, has increased post-pandemic, which means that the uh, length of time that GPs need to see uh, their uh, patients has increased, meaning that there is a great pressure uh, on those services, which is why we continue to invest in the multidisciplinary teams to provide the capacity support that the primary care practitioners need. Question number six, Colette Stevenson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its work to tackle poverty in light of recent analysis by the Joseph Browntree Foundation showing that 86 per cent of low-income households receiving universal credit were going without the essentials and, and that essentials and that nearly one million people in the UK are only ten pounds away a week from poverty. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. Despite facing the most challenging budget settlement of devolution, we are committing to over £3 billion this year to policies which tackle poverty and protect people as far as possible during the ongoing cost of living crisis. This includes investment in our game-changing Scottish child payments, early learning and childcare, and providing free bus travel for over 2 million people. Our action is making a difference with modelling estimating our policies will keep 100,000 children out of relative poverty this year. But we could, of course, go so much further, President Officer, if Westminster matched Scotland's ambition and policies towards eradicating child poverty, such as introducing an essentials guarantee and abolishing the two-child limit. Colette Stevenson. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. With austerity, Brexit and the cost of living crisis, these figures are a shocking indictment of 14 years of Tory rule. And the Resolution Foundation warns their manifesto plans would slash welfare by another £12 billion. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what she will discuss with her UK uh, government counterpart after the election, given key powers are reserved to Westminster? And does she agree with me that it would be better if the Scottish Government could invest more in its own anti-poverty policies rather than having to mitigate cruel Westminster cuts like the bedroom tax. Cabinet Secretary. Well, Colette Stevenson is quite right to point out to the money that the Scottish Government has to invest in our people because of the fact we have to mitigate against uh, welfare cuts. We currently invest £134 million to mitigate against the bedroom tax and the benefit cap. And it certainly appears, presiding officer, eh, that regardless of who wins the next UK election, eh, those mitigations will have to remain in place because no change will be happening eh, regardless of who is in number 10. We would like to go further, of course, on this issue, but it is difficult to see how, when, despite the promises, there is no new funding coming on anti-poverty measures from either party. Number seven, if members are brief, and I call Audrey Nicholl. 
Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government when it last engaged with Aberdeen City Council in relation to reinforced autoclaved aerated concrete. Minister Paul McLennan. Scottish Government officials met with Edinburgh City Council officers on the 4th of June to discuss the Council's progress on their planned rehoming programme and their options appraisal for remediation in properties where RAC has been identified in poor condition. I have committed to continue to engage with Council leaders around this issue and plan to meet with them over the coming weeks as they continue to make progress on this issue. Audrey Nicholl. I thank the Minister for that response. The Minister is aware of the significant well-being toll the RAC situation in my constituency is taking on around 350 households, and I commend council officers for their commitment in supporting tenants as they are rehoused. And similarly, homeowners are deeply concerned about the viability of their properties. Many have substantial mortgages and have worked hard to enhance their homes. The costs associated with resolving this matter will be significant. Therefore, notwithstanding the final option is still being assessed, what financial flexibility exists for the Scottish Government and local authorities to work together to identify the most pragmatic financial solution possible? Minister. Today, Edinburgh City, Aberdeen City Council's only specific request for flexibility has been around the temporary use of Ukraine longer term resettlement fund homes to assist in their planned rehoming project. The Scottish Government worked with them to accommodate this request. We will be happy to give due consideration to any detailed proposals that come forward, and I am sure members across the Chamber will join with me in calling on our incoming UK Government to deliver a dedicated RAC fund. Thank you. That concludes general questions. Before we move to First Minister's question time, I invite members to join me in welcoming to the gallery Natalie Rioua, MNA, President of the National Assembly of Quebec.